Hello, you're watching the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the top stories from around the world. Let's take a look at today's headlines. Pakistan's top court upholds no confidence motion. United States and Europe drive global ecological damage, says report. Yemen's Hadi steps down as president. And Brazil to begin review of landmark quota law. In our first story, Pakistan's Supreme Court has declared that the blocking of a no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Imran Khan was unconstitutional. On April 3rd, the National Assembly had convened to vote on the no-trust motion tabled by the opposition. It had reportedly garnered the 172 votes needed to oust Khan. However, Deputy Speaker Qasim Suri dismissed the motion on the grounds that it violated Article 5 of the Constitution and claimed that it was based on a foreign conspiracy. Shortly after, the Prime Minister called for fresh elections and advised President Ari Alvi to dissolve the National Assembly. This triggered a major political crisis at a time when Pakistan is facing worsening socio-economic conditions. Opposition parties approached the Supreme Court to challenge the Speaker's decision. The court ruled on Thursday that the dismissal of the no-trust motion was a violation of Article 95 of the Constitution. As reported by Don, it added that the dissolution of the National Assembly was illegal. The unanimous decision was announced by a five-member bench led by Chief Justice Bandiyar. According to Geo News, the court added that the Prime Minister was bound by the Constitution and could not advise the President to dissolve the Assembly. The court has now ordered the Speaker to convene the parliamentary session at 10 a.m. on April 9th. The no-trust motion against Khan will proceed. The Prime Minister is due to address the country on Friday. A new report has revealed the extent to which high-income countries are driving global ecological damage. These countries alone are responsible for 74% of excess resource use worldwide. The United States has been the primary source of this crisis, accounting for 27% of excess use. 28 countries in Europe, including the United Kingdom, account for 25%. Other wealthy countries, including Australia, Japan, Canada and Saudi Arabia, collectively accounted for 22%. These findings are part of a major study published in the Lancet Planetary Health. Researchers derived national fair shares of sustainable resource use and used it to determine the extent of ecological overshoot between 1970 and 2017. The study found that the poorer countries of the global south collectively accounted for just 8% of resource overuse. According to The Guardian, lead author Professor Jason Hickel said that the rich countries would have to cut down their resource use by 70% on average. Australia, Canada and the United States have led the world in terms of overshoot per capita. These findings show the sheer imbalance between the global north and south when it comes to resource exploitation and its implication for the climate crisis. The Lancet study followed just days after the UN IPCC released its report on climate mitigation. However, as per reports, the more drastic steps outlined in the report were watered down under pressure of certain governments. On April 6th, more than 1,000 scientists across the world held protests demanding a climate revolution. Actions were organized in countries including Spain, Germany and the United States. We move on to Yemen, where exiled President Abdul Rab Mansur Hadi has stepped down. He announced on April 7th that he would be transferring powers to a new presidential council. The decision came on the final day of talks on the seven-year war in Saudi Arabia's capital of Riyadh. The Houthis had refused to participate in the meeting, calling it a gathering of tanks of the aggression coalition. Hadi has also dismissed his vice president, military leader Ali Mohsen al Ahmar. The Presidential Council will be in charge of political, military and security decisions for a transitional period. This includes negotiating a permanent ceasefire with the Houthis. The body is chaired by Hadi's advisor Rashad al-Alimi, who was also a member of the government of Ali Abdul Saleh. Other members include the head of the separatist Southern Transitional Council, Aydaroz al-Zubaydi, and the governor of Marib Sheikh, Sultan al-Arada. 
Hadith announcement followed just days after a two-month truce came into effect in Yemen. The UN-negotiated ceasefire deal includes an easing of the Saudi blockade of the Hudaydah port and the airport in Sana'a. Following Hadith's announcement, Riyadh announced that $3 billion would be provided to support Yemen's economy. According to state media, it has also called for an international conference. The Houthis captured Sana'a in 2014, forcing Hadi to flee south. In 2015, the Saudi-led military coalition invaded Yemen to restore Hadi with the backing of the US and the United Kingdom. In the seven years since, the war and the blockade against Yemen have killed hundreds of thousands of people and destroyed critical infrastructure. And for our final story, Brazil is set to review a landmark quota law this year. Implemented under President Dilma Rousseff in 2012, it was hailed as a major step in addressing inequality in higher education. According to a 2020 survey by the Institute of Applied Economic Research, 36% of white young people were studying or had completed a degree. The figure stood at 18% when it came to black and brown people within the same age group. Over the years, several pr proposals regarding the quota law have been presented to Parliament. Progressive lawmakers have called for its expansion, which has been opposed by the right wing. Here is a video by Brasil Rifato on the quota law and its review process. Let's have a look. In August 2012, President Dilma Rousseff sanctioned a law on racial quotas. From then on, universities and federal institutes should gradually direct 50% of its vacancies to students from public schools and a part of this percentage to black, indigenous, and disabled applicants. One of the articles of the racial quota law provides for its review after 10 years of the law's enactment, that is, this year. For this reason, dozens of bills were presented to Congress. They were wrote by the federal government's base against the quota policy as well as the opposition that fights for its permanence. We propose to extend this law for 50 years and to create an Affirmative Actions Policy Council in the Ministry of Education. Also, we suggest creating a scholarship policy to support the quota students throughout their study years, because this is a real problem. For their turn, far-right congressmen such as Kim Katagiri presented bills against the quota law. He believes the racial quotas caused a kind of division among Brazilians because it offers what these politicians call differential treatment. Julio Oliveira Souza enrolled at the University of Brasilia as a quota student. She says there is a constant debate on the issue in her class of collective health and that she refutes the anti-quota arguments. It makes no sense because when we compare before the quota, just white and wealthy people had access to the University of Brasilia. It's crystal clear. I knew indigenous, quilombola and trans people at the university. Like most people, I do not spend time with these groups I mentioned in my daily life, but the university gave me this opportunity. However, the supporters of the law acknowledge that some issues still need to be solved. One of these issues concerns cases of fraud in the process of racial self-declaration caused by the lack of clear criteria on color and race definitions. Another issue is the lack of support for quota students. They are often unable to keep studying and end up quitting the university. And that's all for today's episode. For more such stories, visit our website at www.peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching.